Okay, today we're talking about MySQL indexes, histograms, and other ways to speed up your queries. And uh, let me uh, tell you this is kind of a, a dry subject. We'll get into that more later. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Dave Stokes. I really miss not being at the real show this year. Uh, it is a uh, great experience because I've watched all things open grow from a couple hundred people to a couple thousand people. Uh, it is an, an amazing event. Uh, if you need to get a hold of me, uh, I'm at Stoker on Twitter, david.stokes at oracle.com. I'm a community manager for, for, uh, for, for MySQL products. Uh, so Oracle pays me to go around talking about uh, MySQL stuff, except for this year where I don't get to travel as, as much. So let's uh, go on to the next slide. Uh, safe Harbor Agreement. I'm going to be speaking 99.999% today about the open source community edition of the MySQL server and related software. Uh, it is free under the GPL version two, or I should say it's licensed under the GPL version two, which is a little more uh, correct. Uh, if I skip off on a tangent during Q&A uh, about something that's coming out, uh, the Safe Harbor Agreement basically says you can't hold me uh, accountable to it because I don't have perfect knowledge of what's coming out. Uh, so if I mention anything that's not an official product yet, take it with a grain of salt. So big warning, if you're running MySQL 5.6, the end of life is like February 5th of 2021. That means you have five months to upgrade to 5.7. Possibly, hopefully, um, hopefully even better would be upgrade to MySQL 8.0. I highly recommend that. A lot of great features there. So if you're running 5.6, please plan to upgrade. If you're running something earlier, uh, please upgrade ASAP. Uh, by the way, uh, this is a new thing that came out this month. You can now test drive the MySQL database service for free. Uh, if you sign up at this uh, slash cloud slash free at oracle.com, uh, you get $300 in credits, which will last you a long time. Uh, by the way, that McLaren, I wish they were handing out those out to employees. Unfortunately, if they are, I haven't gotten mine yet. Uh, but then Amazon has been kind of late in deliveries in my area. So what are we talking about today? Well, this is a talk on things that you don't really uh, see mentioned um, a lot uh, in a rational, logical manner. Uh, first problem is that no one really complains when the database is running as it should. Um, you'll never hear anyone complain that the database is too fast. Well, what do we mean there? Well, what happens is someone sends off a query and they either want it to come back faster or a little faster. And if you start seeing stuff on the internet about speeding up queries, you see a whole bunch of misinformation or a whole bunch of old information. So we're gonna to talk today about how you speed up queries. And it is not a Harry Potter like dark art. Um, there's no human sacrifices involved other than the DBA sanity. And they don't have a lot of that anyway, so it's not a big loss there. So. The understanding of how to speed up a query is what I want to stress today. Uh, it is actually treated as magic. Uh, a lot of the early DBAs uh, kind of treated it as uh, sacred knowledge and we're not gonna have, pass it on to the, uh, to the general public. But we're gonna talk about what goes on behind. So today we're mainly gonna be looking at the proper use of indexes, histograms, locking options, and some other ways to speed up queries. Well, this is a dry subject. How dry? Very dry. We're talking saltine crackers in the Sahara Desert during the middle of August dry. Um, there's a lot of text on screen. Unfortunately, when you uh, give technical presentations, half your reviews um, that you get at the end of it is that this was too much information. And the other half will say this is not enough information. So uh, I recommend that you go out uh, and download the slides. I should say Dave Stokes instead of David M. Stokes there. Download the slides and use them as a reference uh, later. Uh, try not to absorb it all at once. We're, we're uh, giving you a lot of medicine and you don't have to drink the entire bottle. Uh, matter of fact, it's better if you uh, get through this, uh, get to a point where you literally say, hey, my brain is full and come back later and work through the rest of it. And by the way, database optimizations need to change over time as your underlying data changes. Uh, we're talking about changes in structure and changes in size. Uh, what worked on Tuesday may not work a year from Tuesday. 
Uh, unfortunately, I can't cover a lot of territory that all does tails into this, um, like system configuration on the operating system. By the way, the Linux folks have been doing a lot of neat stuff that have been kind of uh, helping the database world, especially the open source database world. Also not gonna talk about configuration of MySQL. Uh, my general, general thing there is tell people, uh, set your InnoDB uh, table uh, cache size to 75 to 80% of RAM and go from there. Also not talking about hardware. Uh, by the way, there are two types of disk controllers and both will lie to you. One's called write back, one's called write through and they both give you bad information. You don't really get good information. And uh, networking, there's a whole bunch of problems with networking, uh, sharing your database server with your LDAP server or something like that is a real mess. And definitely don't share your database server with your mail server. Uh, you run an email storm and everything just goes to heck. Also not covering normalizing your data. Um, I, I need to do a talk on normalizing the data properly, hopefully for the next all things open where we're all in Raleigh. Uh, basically normalizing your data make sure that you don't have any duplications in your data and you put out, you chop up your data into logical groupings. Uh, why do you do this? Well, it makes things easier and more logical. Uh, it hits the uh, relational calculus and the symbolic logic uh, a lot better. And why am I telling you this? Well, you can't build a sky skyscraper on a foundation of sand. If your data is, is laid out wrong, uh, nothing you're gonna do is gonna make it run better. Um, as I say down the bottom, uh, no matter how much training you give a dachshund, it's not going to run faster than a thoroughbred horse. So I recommend using the third normal form or better. I like using JSON columns where you can have a full gigabyte of data for stub table data, avoiding repeated and unneeded index and table dives. Uh, what I mean there is that if you have a uh, little, it's like you want to get something about a customer and you have to go through the main customer table to a preferences table into a locale table and so on like that. Each one of those is you have to go look up an index and then go into a table, look up another index, go into another table, look up another index and finally get to your main table. Uh, if you're doing that slightly to normalize your, your data and use the JSON data type. Also, you have to think about how you're going to use your data. Uh, I see a lot of folks recording their data as time series, and then they want to go back and look at it as uh, OLTP processing. Doesn't quite work that way. Now, the optimizer is what we need to concentrate on. I uh, consider the optimizer the brain and nervous system of, 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 your, of your database. The optimizer is uh, it, you'll find it in all modern databases and it wants to try to figure out the most efficient way to get your, your data. Uh, efficiency is defined by cost. What is a cost? Well, the cost is the amount of disk reads. Uh, 45 years ago, disks were very slow, very, very expensive. And uh, the idea was to minimize duplication and the number of reads you had to do to get all your data. So optimizers uh, cost things out uh, using historical data. And uh, they look at, they do estimate some things like based on the cardinality of your row or the number of unique entries in the row. And uh, here's the history will define, you can actually go out to the, uh, look at the MySQL source code to see what the optimizer uh, uh, actually runs through stuff. Now, the uh, query optimizer looks at all the options. It wants to find your data once again, the cheapest way. And since part of this is built on historical information, it's like the GPS on your phone or your car. Uh, if I wanna to go to my favorite Mexican restaurant, uh, it's left out of the driveway, first right, uh, first left, uh, left across the railroad tracks, and um, I'm there. Now, the GPS doesn't know there's a train uh, parked across the railroad tracks. It doesn't know that there's some horizontal boring folks that have cut off the end of the road. Uh, so it's, you can see how in a similar way, the optimizer can be misled by uh, inserts of data and other changes. Now, MySQL, unlike a database like Oracle, wants to re-optimize the query each time it sees it. Um, that can get messy for some folks. Uh, by the way, if that kind of bothers you, look for the section on optimizer hints later in this presentation. And by the way, we're going to take a look at show you how to find the query plan and see what the optimizer wants to do. So if you have five joins in your query, 
the optimizer will try to figure out which one goes where best. And this is five factorial um, uh, number of options that it can go through. So that's 120 different options. So you can see how this gets, uh, can potentially get messy quickly. So how do you find the query plan? Well, you run in a, uh, a, uh, an explain on your query. Now, uh, explain basically could take a full week or two to properly run you through. I'm going to give you the highlights. Uh, when in doubt, go out and look at the optimization chapter in the MySQL manual. Uh, there are also books that I'll show you later that go through this very well. Uh, explain basically is prepended on your query. It used to be that it only worked on select. So if you're trying to optimize an update, you had to change it to select and put explain in front of that. Uh, and here you can see the syntax and there's a lot going on here. Uh, it gets very, very um, convoluted very quickly. And uh, of course the output is not exactly the easiest to read, but we'll, we'll run you through it and give you a, a 5,000 foot overview. But now for something completely <laughs> different. Um, there are many tools for looking at queries um, and they're all based on explain. Uh, first, there's the general explain and then there's the qualifier. We change the format. There's explain analyze. And of course, there's visual explain for those of you who like MySQL Workbench. Uh, by the way, MySQL 8022 came out today. So here's an example of looking at explain. Uh, the top line is our query. And what we've typed in there is explain that triggers uh, running explain. And our query that we want to look at is select star, star is the shorthand for everything. Uh, so we're selecting everything from the table city where the country code is equal to GBR. Now the details are, it's gonna come back and say ID of one. It's a simple query. It's working on the table city. Uh, there's no partitions it's gonna use. It has a type of reference that uh, there's many types of queries uh, we'll go in there in this case it's a reference and if you look down a couple of the rows you see the reference is a constant and that's our country code of gbr and the optimizer comes out and does an estimate and it says we're gonna have to read 81 rows to get that information and the filtered 100 we're going that a little bit more but it basically knows all the data in the table and knows how to get that uh, part of that's because it's using a a, a key or an index and it knows the number of entries in the index where it, the country code matches GBR. Now, a little bit below, uh, where after it says one row and set, one warning, where it says note, that is actually the query plan. So it's gonna go out and it says, okay, we're gonna go out and select world.city.id. World is the name of the schema or database that we're in. City is the name of the table and ID is the first column. Remember we have that asterisk up there as a wild card. So it's gonna name out each of the columns in the table. Okay, visual explain. Uh, this is uh, a handy tool. Uh, generally, when you look at it, it gives you different colored blocks. Uh, green is good, red is usually telling you it needs to take a look at it. This is um, a little more information than what you saw in the previous slide, but you'll see other ways how to get that information too. And this is run on the same query. Now, if we do format equals tree, the, the uh, data comes out a little bit differently. You get a tree structure. And as you see here, uh, select star from city. Um, here we're joining uh, the table country and we're gonna match them up where city population equals country population, slightly different query. And it's gonna do a hash join. Uh, traditionally MySQL before 8.0, 17 or 18 did everything by a nested branch loop. Now we're doing a lot of hash joints, much, much, much faster. So it reads in the city uh, tables information and then there's a hash join over the country uh, data of that. And you can see here, we actually have a cost estimate and the number of rows that it wants to read. Uh, table scan on city which means it has to go through all the cities that it's gonna find there. And it's gonna do a table scan on country as part of it doing the hashes. Now, if we do format equals JSON, you get even more information. Uh, this is the same query before we're joining city population and the country population. Uh, it's gonna give us the query cost. It's gonna tell us it has to do a nested loop on country. 
and it's going to read 239 lines and it's going to give some various costs like the read cost, evaluation cost. Uh, it's going to tell us what columns it's going to need to read. And uh, we're going to use city to do the table city to do a hash join. And in that case, what columns we're using there. Now, explain analyze came out 8018. All the explains you've seen up to now use historical information, which is pretty good. Uh, explain analyze actually goes out and runs your query. Uh, so if you're running a query that goes out there and loads several petabytes worth of information, you may not want to run this. Uh, every other case, I really enjoy this. It actually goes out there and gives you the actual time and the actual data. By the way, if you run explain and then run explain and analyze and see a difference in the results or the, uh, from the estimated to the real, run analyze table on that table or the tables involved and update the statistics. Okay, we're gonna have a little bit more on using explain later, but now let's jump over to indexes. Well, indexes are probably the least understood uh, part of uh, database performance tuning. Uh, according to Wikipedia, a database index is a data structure that improves the speed of data retrieval. Well, how does it do that? Well, basically what it does, is it takes the column that you, or columns that you're indexing and creates a mini table with just those values and then where to go get it. And uh, I, I like to think it's a table with shortcuts to another table or a, a model of some of your data within a table. And of course, the more tables and more indexes you have to read in to get the, the data, uh, the slower things run. And uh, databases love memory. So the more memory you can throw in your database server, the better. Uh, best performance you can have is when the entire working set sits in memory. Uh, it, it can get very expensive on a lot of machines. And by the way, use good error correcting memory. So if everything's in memory, you don't have to do disk reads. Uh, and uh, things will just absolutely scream. Now, there are many, many, many types of indexes. And uh, I'm going to cover some of the most popular ones here and some options. Uh, this is the syntax for create index. Uh, as you can see, you do create unique, full text, spatial. Uh, unique basically means uh, one value for that. Um, that uh, um, oh, what do I recommend is a good primer for learning SQL. Um, if you're mathematically involved, CJ Dates uh, primer on SQL. Unfortunately, I can't reach the book right here to get the title. Um, also, if you find a copy of the old MySQL um, um, certification guide, other than that, I really don't have a, uh, um, I would say go out to your local, the other thing is go out to your local bookstore um, and, and grab a used book there. And uh, if it's been written in the past seven years, it should be a pretty good, you know, like MySQL in 24 hours or, or um, something like that. So various options, uh, you're creating an index and you have to specify the table name and what you're indexing. And of course, there's a whole bunch of options. Um, you can say whether you're using a B tree or a hash, uh, other algorithms, um, lock options. And usually you just see create index, as you'll see in a minute, uh, the table name and what you're indexing. Okay, we're creating a table with a primary key. So we're creating a table called T1. Our first column, creatively called C1, is an integer, uh, not null. We'll talk about nulls later. Auto increment, for those of you not used to MySQL, we don't have sequences. So what happens is you set up a column to auto increment and the first value, first data that goes in there gets the auto increment value of one or whatever you pre-selected. Second one gets two, the system keeps track of all this. And notice in red there, we've designated this as the primary key. So in ODB, which is the default table type on, on uh, MySQL these days, uh, really loves primary keys. Uh, you will force a, a key on you if you don't have one. 
So we have a very simple table here. And now whenever we want to look up something, the database is hoping that you're going to try to use the primary key to get to that information. Uh, by the way, an index is a list of keys. Uh, you'll see the terms key and index um, overused and uh, mixed up and inter used interchangeably. And uh, that can get confusing. By the way, in the MySQL world, we have a lot of that. You'll hear schema and database used interchangeably when it's technically a schema, but we tend to use it as a database. So the primary key, this is a key uh, that is hopefully uniquely defined for a row and should be immutable. Uh, in ODB, as I mentioned earlier, needs a primary key. If you don't specify one, it will make one up for you and it's almost guaranteed it would, it's not quite the one you want uh, for high performance. Uh, try not to use null values. We'll get to null values in a minute. And also for those of you who really love UUIDs, they're not a good choice for primary keys. Well, why? Well, they don't monotonically increase. Uh, we're using B trees or actually B plus trees. And they like things to increment uh, in single units or multiples of single units. Uh, UUIDs tend to jump around a lot. And for therefore, they're not very efficient being used as indexes in MySQL. However, we do have a nice little function called UUID to bin, uh, which if you read up the man page on it, will actually show you how to use UUID uh, sort of uh, in a special uh, way to use them as primary keys. I, I really don't uh, recommend using UUIDs, but if you have to, uh, if, if it's the way your, your architect has set things up, uh, that's the way to do it. Okay, you can also index on the prefix of a column. Uh, what do I mean here? Um, oftentimes you don't need to go back and index like all the UUID. Well, maybe on a UUID. Uh, here we're taking the first 10 characters of a name. Uh, probably last name. And in places where most of your names are say like between six and 20 characters long, uh, this will save you some space and some and guarantee you some speed on looking for indexes. Um, sometimes if you're doing some things like on a city name, uh, most city names are relatively short and then you get into Wales and all bets are off. Uh, so in this case, only the first 10 characters are indexed in this example. Uh, it's also, I've seen it used in supply chain where um, it's like the first 15 characters are the manufacturer, uh, where, who the manufacturer is, where it came from, and the rough date number or order number that uh, came in. And then the rest of the information that you, you don't index on is more specific to that part or batch. Okay, multi-column indexes. Uh, here we have a simple little table called test. Uh, by the way, I do all these wonderfully creative names, don't I? Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to have a column for an ID. We're going to have a last name column, a first name column, and we're going to have a primary key of ID. And then we have another index on last name and first name. So when this when data gets added into this table, it's going to um, take whatever you feed it for first name and last name and create an index entry for just that. Now, this search, uh, searching on this index, you can use it for last name and first name or just last name. It works left to right. Uh, you cannot search first name on, on this. Uh, if you're doing a index on year month date, uh, that index will work for year month date, year month, but it won't work for date, uh, won't work for month, uh, it will work for year. And the big hint here is put your highest cardinality or the rarest uh, occurrence field first. And of course you can sub-index these and all that. So if you wanna do the first 20 characters of the last name and all that. Now, what's really exciting is that if you have all the information you want in the index, you don't have to do the dive in the table. And that's called a covering index. And those are um, big payoffs if you can work those out. Hashing values. Uh, sometimes the data you have just doesn't really index very well. And one of the things you can do is take the data in that and create a hash. Uh, in this example, we're uh, gonna hash value one and value two 
Uh, we're going to concat them together and then hash them with MD5. Now, uh, as I mentioned earlier, sometimes your, your data just didn't quite work or you want to obfuscate it. Um, if it's something that's very, very short, uh, reasonably unique, um, it sometimes will speed things up a lot faster. Uh, the wider you index, the more memory it takes up. So if you have something like you're trying to index that's like 200 characters long, uh, this might be another um, another option for you for uh, keeping your data organized. Some other type of indexes, uh, unique indexes, which is only one row per value, uh, full text indexes. Uh, for those of you who uh, run Elasticsearch, you can ignore this. Uh, that's probably a better choice for 90% of the corpus searching out there if you're doing looking into a lot of um, uh, textual data. But if you need um, it's like three to 15 characters and uh, want to do string searches, you can do full text indexes. The ones um, the one for uh, NODB is rather nice where you can actually specify a number of uh, words between finding the first word and the second word. So if you're looking for um, purple car and you want them within five words of each other, like you're searching for a new ride, um, it will return that the occurrences were purple and car within five words of each other. It won't come out and say that uh, he liked Prince's purple rain and 20. Uh, 20 words later tells you that there's actually a, uh, a car for sale in your area. Oh, let's have another Q&A. Let's see if I can do that. Uh, good primer. OK, I'll have to come back to that again later. Uh, covering indexes I mentioned earlier. Uh, that's when like we were searching the last name and first name, and we didn't have to, after we find the index entry, go back and return the data. Uh, so in that case, if you're searching for last name Stokes and it pulls back the one or two records that it matches, you have all that there without having to die on the table. Secondary indexes. Um, secondary indexes are a little bit different uh, than primary indexes. Secondary index is another column in your table that is being indexed. But what's actually saved is not the, the, the data from the column that you index. It's actually saving the primary key. So when you look up uh, like zip code, but you have my uh, my other information saved under my so like social security number or customer ID number. Uh, it will actually use that number in the table for the secondary index. Spatial indexes. This is for geographical geographical information. Here we're using R indexes. So if I have um, geographic information in my database, and by the way, we use the Boost Geometry data. Uh, database libraries, um, very, very handy, very, very powerful. So if I have an index set up to cover, say, like North Texas, uh, it will have a whole bunch of various points within there. And I can check to see, is this point within that index or not within that index? OK, functional indexes. These, um, these really are fun for, for functional indexes. Uh, they're a result of a function applied to one or more columns of a single table. Uh, the first one, we're going to create a table called T1. We're going to have two integer columns. And we're going to have a functional index where we have the absolute of column. Yeah, absolute on a uh, integer is not a great deal. But imagine that was a real. And you're searching for a price. Someone says, hey, show me everything you have in your inventory that's under $10. Uh, the second one, we're doing a create index. Where we're actually adding two columns. So maybe that's the cost of production and the cost of delivery. And someone wants to know, what can I get delivered to me for less than X amount, amount of dollars? OK, the third one we have in there, we're creating index two on table one. We're going to add column one and column two. So what can I get that's under this? And what can I get where the delivery price is more than the actual information? And also, we want to have an index for the original price of production. And you can also do things, uh, as in the last example, column one times 40. Maybe that's a, uh, a markup for, or, or commission. And you can decide, uh, describe them as descending. Uh, in the past, before MySQL 8.0, if you specified a descending index, we lied to you. It really wasn't descending. We just read it backwards. 
However, with MySQL 8.0, uh, it does actually do that. Okay, second Q&A. Let's see what we have. Your secondary energy is both the primary index and the secondary index. Well, the secondary index, think of that as the value for the column or columns that you've indexed with a pointer to the primary key. Hopefully that, uh, that answers that for William Bishop. I'll go back and answer these all again at the end. Uh, we've got plenty of time since we have back-to-back -back sessions. Okay, multi-value indexes. These um, came out about a year ago, very, very handy. The, uh, the JSON data type um, lets you have arrays. Now, traditionally SQL doesn't have, well, MySQL doesn't have an array data type. And I see a lot of people using JSON to try to uh, work around that limitation. Now, traditionally with indexes, you had one entry in the index for every, or for every column that you had indexed, you had one entry in the index table. Uh, doesn't quite work for arrays. So with multi-value indexes, you can actually have multiple values per row in the index. So here we're using um, the member of function and we're looking to see, is there a value of three in this array? And of course it returns the one to tell us that yes, there is. And then you can use other uh, JSON functions to pull out the exact um, item we want or the entire JSON document. MySQL has two main types of index structures. On the left, you have a B tree. And if you follow this out, um, the entries zero to 40, take this branch to this leaf. And we know on this branch, the values zero to 10 are gonna be in this block. 11 to 19 are gonna be over here. 20 to 25, we're not noting. Um, if we're coming over here, we have the values 200 to 250. Uh, they're going to be on this leaf and then it breaks down. So everything um, doesn't quite give you true binary search capability, but it's, it's pretty close. It lets you zero in on things pretty quickly. Um, notice that it's not uh, one leaf, one branch at the very bottom, but it's kind of a block. And you'll see when I start talking about histograms where that comes in. Okay. Hashes are um, more efficient than our traditional nested loose join. Um, you um, basically uh, hash the two values together and return the, the corresponding matches to the client. Uh, older versions of MySQL before 8.0, I believe it's 17, you're going to see B trees. And what we do is we read on one table and do a nested loop branch onto another table, uh, going through the indexes for both. Uh, with hashes, um, basically, you, you can think of it as one big read for the first table, one big read for the second table. Uh, throw them in memory and voila, it pops out the other end. Now, uh, the optimizer, um, the heuristics are, are kind of interesting. If there's a choice between multiple indexes, MySQL normally uses the index that's the smallest number of rows. That is what it thinks is the most selective. That may or may not be true for your data and your application. I will show you later how to, to force uh, force indexes when you find out that there are better ways to do stuff. Now, when you're indexing columns, um, you can use just about any data type you want except for the, the blobs or the JSONs. But if you're comparing them, it helps to have them the same data type and size. Uh, now, Varkar and Char, you can kind of consider them the same. Uh, it's uh, not that not expensive to, to switch between that. Uh, if you're using an integer and a real or an integer and a var car, uh, things have to be casted, they have to be matched up, and that uh, slows things down. Um, also, I really recommend that if you're not using UTF-8 MB4, please switch over to UTF-8 MB4. Uh, MySQL 8.0 is really optimized around that. Um, that gives you the full Latin character set, all four planes of the Unicode. Uh, 9.0 standard, so you can support Chinese, Japanese, and Korean. And plus, the thing that everyone really, really needs in their database, emojis. OK, null. Um, null is one of those great ideas that you kind of wonder if you could go back in time and uh, 
wave of one did not actually change too much. Um, so we don't have um, recreated pterodactyls like uh, Jurassic Park, or maybe we finally get the flying cars they were promised me since I was a little kid. Um, but we'll go into the concept of null. I tend to tell most folks when they're starting out, uh, try to stay away from it as much as possible. Well, what am I talking about with null? Well, in the early days of databases back in the 1970s, um, the question was, okay, if we're gonna use one for true and zero for false, how do we designate that we're missing the data, the I don't know value? And uh, someone came up with the idea, it's, okay, Let's have a value of null. Matter of fact, if you look at old versions of MySQL, you'll see null designated as a backslash capital N as a shorthand. Well, uh, null can be handy in the right circumstances. Unfortunately, not everyone uses it as, in, as intended. Uh, here's another visual example of the idea of null. Uh, probably not the best example, but it, it, it does tend to stick in one's mind. Forgive me if I have scarred your your gray matter permanently on this. Indexing null values uh, really drives it down the performance of the indexes. Imagine you have uh, a database with everyone's house number. Each house has a unique number, but then you have plots of land that don't have a house number. So you just kind of put them in with null values. Uh, if you're searching for a particular um, attribute to that, to that information, and um, you know, you're looking for something that has a southern exposure, for example. Um, the ones with the keys pop up right away, and then the ones with the nulls, you kind of have to grab them all and go out there and, and, and go through there. It's like sorting through a junk drawer to find a battery that may or may not be, be dead. Um, so they're basically unsearchable. So I, I tell people for indexing columns, uh, designate them when you create them as not null. Invisible indexes. Uh, when I first heard about this, I thought this was a weird idea, but the more I played with it, the more I love it. And hopefully you'll learn to love it too. So in the olden days, uh, speak, think back about three and a half years ago, imagine you're a DBA and you're in your office uh, at work uh, in a building uh, with other coworkers down the hall, and you have a index you're not quite sure is doing its job. You're not sure if it's useful and you'd like to free up the memory if you can. So the first thing you do is you check your query using explain. And explain for some reason isn't using that index. So well, maybe I don't need that index. So you blow it away, rerun explain, and in the process of, of looking at the output from the explain command, your phone starts ringing. Um, you start getting uh, text messages and you hear screams down the hallway about suddenly the database is slow. You know, what, what's happened? So you figure, aha, my query doesn't use that index, but their query does use that index. And uh, it seems that everyone in the world is using that index. So you need to get that back. So you, you recreate that index. Hopefully you've written down the definition or have saved it someplace. Um, and it can take seconds or minutes or hours or longer to rebuild that index depending on the size of the data. So um, that was kind of a messy circumstance. After invisible indexes, um, you doubt the usefulness of the index, you check using explain, make that index invisible. So the optimizer on the system and it is system level, uh, cannot see that index. You rerun explain, and once again, uh, you hear the, the cacophony of your coworkers screaming about the database being slow, and you make the index visible, and everyone's happy. Well, the, uh, this is the opportunity where you break out your, your standard problem, you know, blame it on the network, JavaScript, GDPR, Slack Cloud, um, whatever you want to blame it on. Uh, this is a great tool and I really, really recommend it. Um, it's very, very handy. The other thing I recommend is learning how to use, use MySQL Workbench just so you can look at the schema tables. And one of the reports that will give you is which indexes are out there but have not been used in a while. Um, I would say they are candidates for removal, uh, not to be removed. 
but you have to be cautious. Um, some indexes aren't used all that often. Um, so if you just rebooted and you go out there and you'll see a whole bunch of, of uh, candidates out there, uh, they may not have been used yet. They may not have been seeded there. There might be, may not be statistics out there for them. And the other thing is there are some indexes that you will run into during your career that may be used for um, quarterly statements or year end processing. And uh, uh, be very, very careful about blowing away an index. And I recommend keeping it uh, um, invisible for a while before you, you knock it off just to make sure. And then as always, make sure you keep backups. So how do you create an invisible index? I uh, use the alter table uh, statement. So we're gonna alter table T1, alter index I underscore IDX, make it invisible. Well, how do you make it visible? Just same thing, but instead of invisible, you type visible. Uh, very, very handy. Uh, I've used, since this has come out, I've used this several dozen times helping customers solve problems. Uh, this is very, very, very handy. Now histograms. Histograms came out with MySQL 8.0. Indexes have been around since um, the early three days. Um, histograms are, are fairly new. Well, what is a histogram? Well, it's not a gluten-free uh, keto-friendly biscuit. Um, it's more of a frequency distribution of your data. Uh, remember, your the key here is the optimizer needs to know where your data is to be able to go out and get it. And it needs to have a rough idea where it is to give you a, a, uh, a good guesstimate, a swag of how to get to your data. So this is histogram of height of 10,000 US females measured in centimeters, which is not the way we traditionally do that in the United States. Uh, as you can see, the majority of them seem to be around 165 or so centimeters high. So gives you a, a, a distribution. Well, how does a database use that sort of information? Well, Wikipedia declares histogram is an accurate representation of the distribu distribution of numerical data. Uh, it, and we're talking about a approximate distribution within a column. So for MySQL, histograms help the optimizer find the most efficient plan to grab your data. So I like to think of histograms as a series of logical buckets. Um, there are two types, singleton, where each bucket has a single value uh, or a range of values and equi-height, where you basically take um, every, all the data and divide it up evenly. Um, so uh, singletons, you have all the A's, all the B's, all the C's in separate buckets. And equi-height, you have 1,000 people, and you put them in four different buckets of 250 people each. Now, the maximum number of buckets you can have is 1,024. Um, I've been playing this with a while. I haven't really seen a need to go up that high. Uh, you might have a good need and uh, it's available. Now, histogram statistics are useful primarily for non-indexed columns. Now, what do I mean by that? Um, your index data is already indexed and is fast enough for the optimizer to know where it is. Uh, histograms I recommend for data that doesn't churn too often. Um, could be used for some sort of quarterly data. Um, maybe your customers don't move too often. Um, think of stuff that you really don't have to worry about updates more than say two times a week or maybe two times a month. And uh, histograms are only created on demand. Uh, we'll talk about overhead with indexes in a minute. So there is no overhead when a table is modified, but the histogram data is kind of aged and is not 100% accurate anymore every time you add something to it. So why would you use a histogram instead of an index? Well, indexes have a cost. Uh, you insert a record and the, the little model table for keeping the index data has to have that copy of that data inserted into its copy. Uh, if you update it or you delete it, uh, say, likewise, that overhead has to be done. Uh, sometimes when you see sites that have been over-indexed 
uh, especially when they're indexing the same columns over and over and over again, uh, this overhead can get pretty heavy and uh, that can really degradate the performance. And occasionally the optimizer will make index dives uh, as things change, uh, as data is updated or, or, or uh, deleted, uh, does index dives to try to get an estimate of uh, what's in a given range. Uh, think of this as doing inventory. And this can become costly because it's not gonna pick the best time for you to go out there and dive into your, your data and figure out if everything's still laid out in, in nice balanced B-trees. Uh, it's going to do it when it's convenient for the optimizer. So histogram statistics are a lot cheaper. Now, occasionally the optimizer, as brilliant as it is, um, fails to find the most efficient plan and ends up spinning its wheels, um, executing a query, or give you a query plan that's going to uh, be less than optimal. Now, the optimizer assumes that the data is evenly distributed in a column. Um, not all the time. Um, the old joke about, you know, when you assume you make an ass out of me, it really comes to life here. So the optimizer often doesn't have enough knowledge of what's going on. Um, it uh, may not know exactly how many rows are in each table. Uh, it, it can has that information at hand, but it may not know it um, inherent without going out there and seeking that information. Uh, also, it may not know how many distinct values there are in each column. Now, these are columns that are indexed, by the way. And uh, how is the data distributed in each column? Uh, if you're looking at um, um, ages, you could probably figure a random uh, Poisson distribution if you have a general set of data from uh, the general population. It uh, might be heavily skewed if you have a bunch of teenagers. So. Um, the optimizer wants to, wants to know all these pieces of information and actually more. So as I mentioned earlier, we have two types of histograms. Uh, the equal height, uh, one bucket is the range of values. Uh, so if in school you were told line up A to G, H to L, M to D, and U to Z, and uh, you're like me and you're the last bucket, um, it always helped because we always had extra time to line up and get ordered before because they're too busy with the Adamses and the Charleses and the Dickenses and the uh, Egberts. Now singleton, uh, one bucket represents one single value in a column. And these are, uh, prob this is the most accurate of the two. Um, I'd say the equa height is kind of like a 5,000 foot overview and the singleton is flying uh, literally just above the ground. So. Let's take a look at a frequency histogram. Uh, we have three buckets, uh, creatively named 101, 102, and 104. I have no idea what happened to 103. And we're going to insert into um, our table uh, two 101s, two 102, well, three 102s, and one 104. So two here, three here, one here. Now, if we select the ID and um, the value from our table, we see we have the two 101s, three 102s, and the one 104. So if we analyze table frequency histogram, which is the table created, and set up three buckets, um, we can print out some information from the information schema uh, table, or schema and the table column statistics. And it'll come back and tell us the histogram buckets that have been set up. So we know bucket 101 has one third of all our information. So as the optimizer is looking for where it has to read, it knows that it reads 101, it's gonna have uh, 33 and a third percent of all the information. If we look in the second bucket for the value of 102, we know the first and second buckets that we have 83 and a third of all the data. And if we look in the last bucket, we know that including it and the previous buckets, we have everything. Uh, we have 1.0% uh, uh, of 100% uh, of everything. And by the way, this information comes back and does this, tells us that we do have a singleton Now, if we look at the statistics, um, we're going to go out and look at the column statistics. And we know that 
Um, for our value of 101, our cumulative frequency is 33 and a third. And our, our frequency is a third. I wish that wasn't popping up again. Uh, for the value of 102, our cumulative frequency is 83 and a third, and the frequency is 50%. And for 104, our frequency is only 16.7. But if you have all the buckets of value 104 and below, you have 100% of the cumulative frequency of the distribution of the data. So how do you create a histogram? Well, you use the analyze table um, statement. Uh, the first one, we're going to go out and create a histogram on C1, a histogram on C2, and a histogram on C3, each with 10 buckets. So those are three separate histograms. You're not creating a histogram with C1, C2, and C3 somehow merged together. I want to get rid of a histogram. Um, you do the analyze table drop histogram. Uh, if you want to change the bucket size, um, you just do an analyze table, name the column, and change the bucket size. Uh, for information on histograms, uh, you can go out to the information schema .column statistics information, and it will give you um, what the table is, uh, what the column names that you have a histogram on, the data type, and by the way, you can't have histograms on strings. That's designed mainly for numerics, but it does work. As you can see, there's various bucket counts. So this is an example where histograms really shine. Uh, where things uh, really pop for you. We're going to create a table called H1. We have an ID field that's an unsigned integer. And then we have X, which is another integer unsigned. And into our table, we're going to insert two ones, three twos, and four threes. And if we select the um, the value and the count of each value, as we see, once again, we have two ones, three twos, and uh, four threes. Now, if we run a explain on select star from H1 where X is greater than zero, the, um, the server will go out there and it knows that there's nine rows out there. And it's gonna estimate that it's gonna have to read 33 and a third of all the tables. Filter is kind of a, a, a rough guesstimate of how much data that it knows where it is. And um, it's kind of like you go out to the garage and you know where the Christmas ornaments are or the Hanukkah ornaments or some other ornaments. And you think they're in two boxes, but you find out that no, there's another box that you're missing that you have to go out and find. Um, so in this case, the optimizers come back and said, yeah, I um, nine rows and I'm gonna have to read about a third of the, the data. And as we know, um, if you look up the where statement, X is greater than zero, R values are greater than zero. So um, this is an example of, of how the optimizer wants to give you an estimate and it may not be uh, an accurate estimate. So let's analyze our table. Let's create a histogram with three buckets. Why three buckets? Well, we only have three values. I could have done more buckets, but they would have just been uh, unused. So now when I do explain, select star from H1 where X is greater than zero, it knows that there's once again, nine rows and it knows where all the data is. So the estimate it's gonna give us, um, the query plan it's gonna give us is um, a little more, more intelligent. Uh, of course, it's a very simple uh, query, and I wish I had something that was a better example for a more complex thing, but that really wouldn't fit in the time period that we have here. So if we look at this with explain analyze, remember explain analyze actually runs the query uh, where we're going to explain just kind of does a, a guesstimate. Uh, it goes out and gives us um, the full information. Now notice on the bottom line that tells it that it has to do a table scan. Uh, traditionally, DBAs will tell you that you don't want a full table scan. Well, that's not always a bad thing. Uh, in this case, we're looking at all the records in that table. Uh, if you're doing quarterly statements, you probably have to go through all the customers uh, to get that, and that's a full table scan. So the hard and fast rule that you want to get rid of all ta full table scans uh, is not actually a hard and fast rule. 
Okay, performance is just not indexes and histograms. Uh, there are a lot of other tweaks that can be uh, done to speed things up. Uh, you can use explain to see what your query is doing. And one of the things you'll see is reports on file sorts, full table scans, using temporary tables. And um, that's handy. You'll take, we'll take a look at that a little bit. Also, uh, does the join order look right? We'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, buffers and caches, big enough. We don't really have time to cover that today, but uh, there's some other things you can do to look at. Uh, do you have enough memory? Uh, if your system is three years old and you've added 500% new customers uh, in the past quarter, uh, you might be constrained by your hardware. Also, uh, disks have rapidly been evolving. Uh, if your uh, disks, for those of you who haven't done everything on the cloud yet, um, your disk might be um, holding you back. So something we've also changed in NATO is locking options. Uh, the two we introduced that might change the way you architect things is the no wait option and the skipped lock option. Um, these I'll show you in a minute with, a, uh, with some examples are very, very handy. Um, traditionally, when you, when you lock, try to lock some information, uh, either it locks all that for you, that exactly what you requested, or you're told to wait while it goes out there and get those, lock, those locks for you and you're constrained for whoever else has the data locked and is waiting to lock it in front of you. So this example, we're gonna go out and buy some concert tickets and we're going to start a transaction. Uh, pretend you're Ticketmaster, by the way, Ticketmaster does use MySQL for its uh, seating front end. And we want to find seat numbers and row numbers and the cost of tickets from a table called seats that we're going to abbreviate as S. And we're going to join that to the seat rows table called SR using the row number. And we're looking for seats in rows, uh, seats three or four and rows five and six. Uh, maybe this is a lucky seat for us. Maybe this is the uh, best uh, acoustic uh, place in the entire auditorium. So we're looking for specific seats in new specific rows. And of course, we don't want to go out there and look for those tickets if they're already locked. And we're going to lock these tables for update. And then we're going to tell it skip lock. Now, in this case, if seats three and four and five are already locked by someone, you'll only get the records for row six. If both seats three and four and both rows are already taken, um, you get a return right away saying, hey, um, those aren't there, but have you looked in rows seven and you can surmise logically, let's look at rows seven and eight, maybe we can get there. Uh, lock no wait, uh, just a slight variation on, on this. So once again, we're looking for seats three and four and we're looking for rows in uh, or seats three and four in row 12. And again, not booked. And we're going to do skip locked. And we want to share these seats. And we're going to put this in as no wait. If these are available, uh, you'll get that, you'll get that, uh, those records locked for you to update. Uh, if they're not available, it returns right away. Now, if we hadn't had no wait on there, you would have had to wait for a default timeout of 50 seconds, uh, which if you're uh, trying to go for hot uh, seats for a hot concert, um, you can know that that's often um, a bad thing. You're not gonna go into that, see that artist that you wanna see. Okay, other fast ways of improving your queries. Well, we're gonna talk about resource groups, optimizer hints, partitioning, and multi-value indexes. Uh, resource groups, um, if you have a multi-core, uh, multiple virtual CPU machine, you can create resource groups. Uh, in this case, we're going to create a group called Batch for low priority processing, and we're going to dedicate two CPUs to it. Uh, we're hoping here that you have at least a four CPU machine to do that. Uh, by the way, you, you can lock yourself out uh, of other virtual CPUs by specifying all your CPUs for a a uh, resource group that you're uh, going to default to. Uh, set a thread priority. And 
when you're making your queries, uh, you can either type in set resource group batch uh, in the start of your transaction, or this is called an optimizer hint. Uh, we make a, a comment inside the query. And say, like you know that, um, well, we'll talk about that later. So when you go to insert these records and see these resource batch group, the optimizer will push these off to those two virtual CPUs for that group, resource group. Optimizer hints. Uh, once again, these are comments within a query as you see there in red. Uh, in this example, you know that if you join T1 to T2, it gives you the performance you want. Remember, the optimizer wants to go for the smallest of the two targets first. So in this case, um, maybe T2, uh, well, let's just say T2, T2 doesn't give you the performance you want. So you want to force it to go T1 to T2 instead of T2 to T1. Now, there are lots of other optimizer hints on there, type of push down conditions. You can do a whole bunch of other stuff. Well, this is probably the, uh, the handiest one. Partitioning. Um, you can actually partition your data uh, by a value in a, in a column. Hopefully, please, please, please use a key. Uh, this is supported with our NODB and NDB storage engines. And if you want to partition your data by some sort of time interval or by a geographic location or something like that, you can actually um, have different uh, platters, different partitions, different areas uh, segmented off for this. And the optimizer will know that if you're looking for something in Great Britain and you're partitioned off by country, it will go, just go to that partition. So let's go a little bit more into the, how the query optimizer really, um, really does stuff for you. Um, this is where things get a little tricky. So if you have some capping with you, please take a big gulp right now. So here's our query. We're going to select from the table city, its name. We're going to select from the city country, its name column. And we're going to join the country column to the city column on two column uh, tables on two columns. In the city call city table, there's a column called country code that corresponds to the country.code column. And in this case, we're going to look for where the country code is equal to GBR. So fairly simple. We're driving two pieces of information, one each from two different tables. And we're only interested in those from Great Britain. So once again, um, I feel like a magician explaining a very bad card trick here, but we're going to go out there and get city.name and country.name from the city table and the country table. That's how the two tables are uh, correspond to each other. And once again, we only want all the records that correspond where the country.code could have been the city.country code equals to GBR. Now the optimizer sees your query and looks at it and says, okay, is there something I can do here to simplify it? Well, if you run explain on it, um, you see the, the basics of the two queries. Um, as you see the top one, uh, it's gonna to wanna to use the, the table country. It has uh, a constant. The constant is country code equals GBR. Uh, this, is, this is the tricky part here. Country code equals GBR is a constant. Uh, it sees that we have a possible key of using the primary. It is going to use the, con the primary uh, in the city. Uh, it has a possible key and it's using its possible key. And once again, both these, it says filtered 100. So it knows roughly where, well, it knows pretty well where the data is. So if we look at the actual query, query plan, it tells us that uh, it's going to select world.city uh, the name, capital N name as name. It's going to select United Kingdom's name from world.city, join world.country, world, world city name, country code equals GBR. So the optimizer, remember we're going out there to, to two tables. Well, the optimizer said, well, we don't really need to that dive into the second table um, to get the, the name for that one piece of output. 
And I also noticed um, that it, instead of, uh, it's, it's done the world.city country code equals GBR. Where earlier we had country.code equals GBR. So it's gone from country over to city there. So the optimizer knows just to grab the GBR records from the city table and does not really need to read the country table at all. So the optimizers saved us some, um, some work there. And when you run explain and analyze, um, you can see that uh, our guesstimate from the previous step is, was pretty good. Now to, to dig into this again, once again, uh, when you're reading the output from explain, um, we had this country code equals GBR. So it knows that the type of query we're gonna do is gonna be using a constant and uh, that's our country code is a GBR. Now, a little bit further down, if you look at the type for the second query on city, it's a reference. And once again, that's the GBR. Now, if you run out to the manual for MySQL, it will tell you what the various columns mean. And um, if you've never looked through this before, uh, I recommend a, a good read. There's a lot of information here. There's some books later I'll recommend that uh, go into more detail. Uh, but the basic output you're getting are which columns um, um, are being looked at, uh, the table name, if there's any partitions. Um, uh, the, um, I should explain this. This is um, when you, for the type of join, where you have um, type here for constant or reference. Um, you'll see a whole bunch of um, join type information that um, is out there. Um, this is the raw data that comes to you. It is tricky to learn how to read. Uh, it is worthwhile doing if you have a lot of queries that you're responsible for. Uh, the trick to, to watch for is, are there possible keys out there? And what keys is it actually using? It can only use one key at a time. So some general rules, um, go out there and look at indexing or histogramming columns on the right side of a where clause. Um, also look at sorting um, or indexing columns that you sort on on a regular basis. Uh, be sure you test that. Uh, once again, uh, join on like types and size columns. Also, if you can do a covering index where you get all your data out of the index, um, um, so like you have a limited number of customers, you index um, maybe their customer number and their, their zip code so that when they, or their postal code, so that when they uh, call you up and say, I'm customer one, two, three, four, uh, what's the shipping rate to uh, Raleigh? It actually has that information because you have the zip code and you can uh, look that up in another table for the uh, shipping rates. Okay, let's look at a nastier uh, query. Uh, this one is from our Sequila database, which you'll see in a lot of MySQL documentation. Uh, the Sequila database was a recreation of a video tape rental store. Uh, believe it or not, to the younger generation, uh, if you wanted to see a movie, you drove to the nearest strip mall, went to a shop usually called Blockbuster, uh, searched through the aisles for the available movies, and uh, actually rented them for a set amount of time. Now, in this example, uh, we're going to select some data from one table called rental. That's going to be joined on the customer. On another table has the customer's address. Uh, we're actually going to go out and have an inventory for all the, the videotapes. We're going to get uh, uh, the list of information on the film that's from the inventory. And we're going to do um, uh, we're gonna look for the ones where the rental return date is null, which means it hasn't been returned in this case. We're also looking for the uh, uh, the rental date is 
the rental date plus an interval for the length of time you could rent the, the tape. Hot tapes you could rent overnight, um, less interesting tapes uh, you could rent for a longer period of time and check that against the current date. So you're kind of looking for uh, who has the most amount of tapes out uh, that need to be returned. So if you run explain on this, you get a lot of stuff back and um, the old uh, Migo, my eyes, uh, glaze over when you look at that. But there's a really, um, there's really a treasure trove of information in here. Um, so what you do is you start simply. Uh, if you're beginning at this, I recommend um, looking at it with visual explain. This helps give you a rough idea what happens. We're going to go out and scan the full table of rental to find all the, the movies and uh, check which ones haven't uh, met our other conditions. And see this is all uh, nested loop joins here and gives our information. You actually see the, uh, the cost of the various steps. Uh, this step is the cost of 560, has to read one row. Um, here where things are combined and sorted, you see the total query cost ends up being 5,500 roughly. So, Let's look at this uh, in tree format. Uh, it uh, gives you the same information as you saw on the, the previous um, page, but doesn't give you a lot of detail what's actually going on. So back to the old tabular explain. And once again, uh, this can make your eyes glow release over. Uh, and once again, if this is kind of overloading, you come back later, the slides are available uh, and you can go through all this. So we get this information and let's take a look at it um, cleaned up a little bit. Uh, we have the name of the tables. We're going after rental customer address inventory film. Uh, we see possible keys that it can use. In this case, it has one, two possible keys, but it's not using a key. So usually full table scans are bad things. In this case, uh, it's unavoidable. Uh, in this case, uh, the customer table, we have two possible keys and it's using the primary. And as we know, primaries are, uh, are pretty nice, uh, usually a little bit faster than secondaries. So that's, that's good information. Well, what else uh, do we need to know? Well, here's all the keys that are possible. And uh, once again, this one doesn't use any keys. So, that's always going to be whenever you see a full table scan or type equals all, uh, always make sure that you really need to get all that information. So back to our our uh, our, our nasty query with all the joins in here. Um, let's take a look at it um, with a little more discerning eye. So a lot of folks are going to look at this type of query and they're going to come back and say. Why is this query so slow if it only returns five records? Uh, if you notice down here on the bottom, it says limit five. Well, what happens is to get this information, it has to compile all the information. So yes, it's only returning five lines of data, five rows of data, but it has to compile all the data to give you the top five. Uh, if you don't have to rank data, um, uh, it's usually faster. So if we come back here and take a look at our, our nasty explain output, um, this is the extra field. This wraps badly and I couldn't figure out a way to do it. Uh, it tells us that we're using a where statement, which means there's extra logic that has to go on more than a straight join. We're using a temporary table. Temporary tables are a lot faster in MySQL 8.0. If you're running 5.7 or before, what happens is there's a preset limit on the temporary table. This is a special storage engine. When it got to a certain size, everything would halt. All the data would be copied over to an InnoDB table and then restarted. Uh, that, that halting copy restart was very expensive. Also file sort. Uh, file sorts, um, you have to go out the disk and have the system do the, the file sort or you do file sort within the server. Uh, that's an expensive thing. Maybe if we index the column there, um, we, don't, we can avoid that. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, the 8.0 temporary table space is much, much, much faster. And uh, you'll find it roughly between 10 and 15% faster. 
So when you start looking at that answer query, you're gonna go out there and say, is there something unindexed that we might index? Um, or could it be something better if we used a histogram? Also, the other thing is, is there a better way to make a key? Could we make a composite key? Could we use two or three columns to, uh, to do what we need to do? So one of the things you can do is you can type the, uh, to check on indexes, you can you type show index from rental. Uh, we'll find out there's actually more indexes out there than what we're seeing in the explain. Uh, there's the primary, of course, there's one for rental date, uh, there's one for inventory ID and the customer ID. Also, we have two foreign keys and they tie to other tables. Uh, same with film, there's more indexes out there that we saw from explain. Also something you might wanna do is consider a functional index. Uh, this stuff in red, we're trying to figure out a rental date plus interval time and check that versus current date, which is a function call. Um, maybe you can uh, find a way, a uh, generated column or a functional index to actually get that materialized in its own column. So you know what, what videos are due back on what dates. Uh, how do you do this? Well, trial and error. Uh, one of the problems with a declarative language like SQL is that you can't look at a, a query and tell if it's good or not. Uh, if you've been programming for more than say two months or so, you can look at a piece of code and tell whether it's good or not. Um, procedural languages and object-oriented languages, uh, you can look at that. Uh, it's called a code smell. Uh, occasionally you hear older programmers going into someone's GitHub library, they look at something and they go, that code doesn't smell right to me. They look at the code, just something doesn't ring performance to them. Uh, SQL, yeah, can't do that. You have to look at the underlying data structure and the other underlying indexes. So uh, let's say we wanna go out and add that column. Um, do we wanna run an alter table? Before 8.0 adding a, a column was very expensive. Everything had to be copied over. Uh, basically processing halted, the table that you were, cop that you were modifying, that you're adding the uh, column on, uh, was tacked on like the framework of the other one and then the data was copied over. Also, if you add a new column, how do you see the data? We run a functional index on that information. How do we get that information in there? Probably have to write a, a quick and dirty to do that. Uh, if we use a generated column, um, this is the type of data that we can extract and make some computation on and put in there. Would it be better if we had a stub table, write something in, in JSON to get rid of extra uh, index and table dives? Also, how much of your code do you need to change to support that and other considerations? Uh, this is why DBAs um, tear up their hair. Oh, we just wanna add this to that. And uh, can you change this at the same time? Uh, these type of changes can be very expensive and very messy. So let me start going to wrap up mode here since you've been uh, nicely sitting here for a long time. Uh, where to look for information. The definitive guide is the MySQL manual. I believe it's chapter eight that talks about query optimization. That's a, worth a good read. I also like to point you to two resources, forums.mysql.com, which has, I think, like 34 subgroups, uh, especially one on performance. Uh, there's groups for newbies, uh, jobs, uh, certification, uh, the newbie storage engine, uh, various uh, interfaces for Python, PHP, and all that. Also, mysqlcommunity.slack. Uh, our engineers really uh, monitor that heavily. So if you have a question, uh, forums is a good shot, but I think these days the Slack is a little bit better. Uh, if you're running MySQL 8, you need this book, Jesper Wisborg Crow, a former colleague of mine. Uh, his other books are outstanding. Uh, this book weighs about seven and a half pounds. It's probably 500 pages. I'm on my third reading through it and I'm finding new stuff all the time. It is a great book for query tuning especially based around MySQL 8. Uh, another book, uh, especially if you can find the third edition, not the first or second, uh, this is getting a little, a little bit long in the tooth, but it does explain, explain very well. Um, unfortunately, I don't think there's gonna be a fourth edition. Uh, very, very uh, good book. You can usually find this in a used bookstore. Uh, a lot of DBAs uh, who've had a copy of this, you'll find notes, you'll find post-it notes, you'll find, uh, uh, other stuff in there, there it's a, a great book. Uh, by the way, if you're working with the JSON data type, the second version of my book, um, 
of MySQL and JSON, a practical programming guide has just come out in the past 10 days. Uh, the original book was 108 pages. This one's 247 pages. Uh, there was a lot of changes in two years with JSON and MySQL. A lot of programming examples. If you look at the uh, manual pages on the JSON functions and all that, they're a reference guide. They're not a teaching tool. I wrote a lot of uh, example code so that you can see what goes on. There are illustrations so you can see what uh, the commands look like when you run them. Has a lot of information on best practices. So if you're uh, using the JSON data type or want to get started with the NoSQL JSON document store with MySQL, this is a, a handy resource and uh, hope you'll buy a copy. By the way, if you work for a startup, Oracle would like to help you. Um, you can enroll at oracle.com slash startup. Uh, what it gets you? Well, it gets you a big discount on uh, on getting into the, the cloud. Uh, lots of discounts, uh, global exposure with marketing. Uh, we'll do a lot of promotion for you. And uh, it's a very exciting program. And if you are a startup and, uh, and are looking to, to build quickly, this is a great way to do it. And with that, um, I want to thank you. If you uh, want to get a hold of me, uh, we're going to have a Q&A session. I'm willing to answer questions as long as people are around. On Twitter, I'm at Stoker. I have a blog at elephantdolphin.blogspot.com. Um, Planet.mysql is a MySQL blog aggregation uh, point, as I mentioned before, the forums and the community Slack. And the uh, slides for this presentation are on slideshow slash Dave Stokes. Um, let me go back to um, Q and A. Uh, let me go back to Sheila's question. What would I consider a good primer? Um, let's see if I can. Uh, not gonna let me do that. Um, basically, any MySQL book that's under about seven years old, I'd recommend. I, I, if you have a good used bookstore in your area, I recommend that. Um, the other great thing about MySQL is it is very, very well documented online. So you can go out there and find all sorts of resources. Um, my, my favorite guide, the guide that really uh, honed my professional teeth with MySQL was the old 5.0 certification guide. That's a great guide. Uh, Paul Dubois has a book on MySQL that is another eight page or 800 pager. That's great. Okay, let's go on to uh, William's question again, then I'll get to Rose. Um, do secondary indexes use both primary index and the secondary index? Um, if the index you consider having the, um, the value that you want indexed, uh, so like my zip code 76247, and then we'll have a pointer to where in the table space where the data is, the secondary index uh, points to the primary and the primary goes right to the data block. Um, that's the best way I can describe that. Do I have recommendations for understanding why indexes are chosen or don't show up as possible index in 5.6? Uh, once again, admonition 5.6 ends of life in, in five months. Uh, by the way, I don't know what AWS, uh, Google, or anyone else is doing uh, for, for that uh, occurrence. But uh, by the way, the MySQL cloud out there is running 8.0, and you do get the full enterprise edition. So you get the great backup tool, the great monitoring tool. Okay, why indexes aren't chosen? Um, usually the, the most common reason is that it has a choice of two indexes and it's gonna to try to grab the smaller, kind of wants to grab the most selective. Um, it's, um, um, let me type in, could be looking at the smaller of the two options. And of course, keep my, my typing is not always. Um, the, the other thing is the optimizer is not perfect. Uh, you, you could need to run analyze table to update the statistics. For the optimizer. So there's uh, a lot of um, stuff that go there. Um, got me. Oops, let me go down here. Let me 
me stop the share. And there I is. Um, boy, 49 of you stood through the, the entire thing. I wanna uh, thank you for that. Um, um, let's see, from Michael Aker, I'm gonna start blaming everything on GDPR. Join the Europeans early and often. Um, uh, from Alan Mason, thanks as always for the great talk. Thank you, Alan, say hi to Carmen for me. Uh, by the way, if you don't know them, make sure you meet them next year when we're all live. Uh, they are great folks and they're both DBAs. Can I show us the reference links? Last slide. Um, I think I can. Let me do that. Um, already done, done slides, download slides. This is an informative information. Thanks, a million. Uh, from Jake Galligan, thank you. Okay, let me go back to the uh, last slide. And there we go. And let me take this out of full screen mode so I can see other questions. And it's not gonna do that. Well, um, I'll keep this up for another few seconds and I'll go back to uh, looking at the Q&A and the comments. Okay, uh, when can we access the recording? Um, I'm sure the wonderful organizers um, of All Things Open will have them online. I actually recorded, pre-recorded a version of this, so I don't know which they're gonna record. Uh, hopefully they will inflict both on the world. Um, I'm sure they'll have them up there shortly, as soon as we can. Um, Todd, Jennifer, and the crew do an amazing job. And, um, and this show has grown from a few hundred people to a few thousand people uh, rather quickly. And uh, it's a, a great event and they're they are so thorough. I'm sure they probably already have them up there and I'm dummy me just doesn't know where they have them. Oh, there's the thing, AT is recording this talk and we're providing links for access. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, someone, Alexis Smith wrote, uh, downloaded the books from my company's Blue University and plan to begin reading soon. Um, bless you there for doing that. Uh, without anything else, um, I wanna thank you for attending. Uh, lots of other good chats out there on databases. Uh, if you've never gone to a real conference, uh, this is a real conference, I shouldn't say that. If you've never gone to a conference in person, uh, I usually recommend, and I do recommend for virtual con conferences, if you have an opening in your schedule and there is a talk that on a subject you know absolutely nothing about, uh, invest 30 minutes of your time and go listen. Uh, it might expand your horizons. You might find that little nugget in the bottom of the stream that ends up being your, your future fortune. Or it just might be something you say, gee, I now know all about subject X that I ever wanted to do. And with that, I'd like to thank the uh, wonderful organizers of All Things Open. Uh, don't forget their other shows, Open Source 101. Hopefully we'll see you in Austin next April. Uh, Austin's a, one of my favorite cities. And with that, um, you can uh, pay me later. Oops, one more on the Q&A. Does MySQL calculate histograms on index columns? Uh, usually you index or you histogram. You don't do both. Um, you probably could do an index on histogram, but that'd be kind of redundant. And uh, as soon as the index data starts changing, uh, the histogram comes out of date. Why would you care about histograms on non-index columns? Well, maybe you have data that doesn't change too often. Uh, shipping rates, uh, actuarial rates, if you're uh, into insurance. Um, maybe it's a, a piece of information that doesn't change too often. The United States has not added another state in my lifetime. So if I had a table with um, state codes in there, it might be better to histogram rather than, than index. And in cases where it does a full scan, yeah, you kind of get a wash, but at least the optimizer is a better idea. Uh, downloading the slides, um, um, you'll see that either in the recording presentation or uh, you go to slideshare.net slash Dave, D-A-V-E Stokes, S-T-O-K-E-S. And with that, I'm going to wrap this up. Thank you all for, uh, for coming and uh, have a great day and enjoy the rest of the talks.